Daniel, welcome to the Power Within You podcast. It's really lovely to have you here today with me. Um, I was, you know, it was it was amazing to see what you've been doing um, with 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 your company over the last few years. And, and as, as I mentioned to you before, season three is really about focusing on neurodiversity. So tell me, tell me more about yourself. Tell me what piqued your interest in in, in neurodiversity and where, where you why you came to where you are now. Well, yeah, thank you for having me on today. Um, yes, my name is Daniel Ahern. <clears throat> like I always tell people that I basically got into what I do completely by accident. When I was younger, I wanted to be a social worker and I spoke to a social worker and she said the best way to get into social work would be to do some volunteering. And the very, very first piece of volunteering I ever did happened to be with an autistic boy back in the year 2000. And it also really shows how far we've come to from then because the idea of that volunteering was that we were aiming to cure the boy of his autism, which is right. obviously quite shocking uh, in today's world. And I did an event the other night um, with a with a law organisation, and it was about nurturing neurodivergent talent. And I thought it was so refreshing to see how far we'd come from, <laughs> from curing uh, and not just placing, but then nurturing. So that's how it started. I got so interested in autism and difference of thought that my career took me that way. So I never became a social worker. I went to work at the National Autistic Society and I worked in a role where we helped autistic people into work and we helped autistic people at work. And a uh, big learning from that role was as individual as every autistic person was, every workplace was the same. Mm-hmm. So as individuals, each autistic person was I was supporting. Every time I went to a workplace, I was saying the same stuff. So I was talking about their barriers in recruitment, the barriers around managers not having the understanding around the topic. Um, there wasn't any policies around it. There was no culture around it. So I felt very early on in my career, I think I felt this for my whole life. I was like, why isn't everyone doing this? Um, why isn't everyone focusing on changing the workplace and not changing the autistic person? And um, I still think the the emphasis is 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 slightly off. But lucky for me, that's sort of how I've, um you know made a living really just focusing on helping workplaces become more inclusive and my philosophy really is how can how can you change as workplaces to become more inclusive obviously neurodivergent people can um adapt and develop in the world and 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 they should get that support but so much i saw was always coming up like wording in recruitment or like i said managers not having understanding so after I left the National Autistic Society, I set up Adjust about eight years ago now. We focus on um, training employers, still that same philosophy. Um, we do a lot of awareness through a lot of lunch and learns. We do a lot of training with recruitment teams and managers. Um, and I'm also the author of a book called The Pocket Guide to Neurodiversity, which, mm-hmm. <clears throat> talking about accidents, that happened by accident. I was delivering a session one day to a publishers, and they said, this would be a great book. And I and I said, okay, brilliant. And then I didn't do anything for a year. Um, and in that year, because I'd struggled so much with the book, I also got diagnosed with ADHD myself. And that was an interesting journey because I had to ask for help and actually I'd spent most of my life helping others. So it was, that was interesting. And, and that sort of brought me to you today, really. Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing story. Sometimes you do fall into things by accident, but you're also kind of passionate about it, right? So yeah. you kind of get taken down this path. And how how awesome to kind of do the delivery to publishers and then said that would be a great book yeah. as well. Yeah, just but that. Did they yeah. end up publishing you then? Is that the company that ended up publishing you? Or was it... Yeah, yeah. The Pocket oh, Guide to Neurodiversity. I've got it here. We're, um... Oh, look at that. Yeah, Brilliant. and it was lovely because it was by a um, publisher called Jessica Kingsley. And mm-hmm. I remember very early on in my career learning about autism and stuff that I used to read loads of books from them. So it was quite special for me to that that came back round. In, in yeah, the end. that's amazing. Congratulations on your book, by the way. It's um, amazing. When did you? When did it uh, go? Came when was it published? January. Um, Fantastic. And I'm just still getting used to 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 talking about it and, and having it. <laughs> it's it's almost like yeah, because it, it feels like such. Sometimes if you've been thinking about it for a while or you know whatever it is, it comes true. Then it's kind of like you know you have settled into that that yeah, success. Exactly, I suppose, yeah. and, and I'm I'm sure it's bringing such value as well to other people. Um, so you know, one one thing I wanted to ask is um, when it comes to neurodiversity, people are often confused about what that could encompass mm. um, as well. So what areas that can encompass, and also how it differs from mental health. So yeah. could you sort of provide some context on that for us? Definitely. So. 
When I talk about neurodiversity, I talk about it as a recognition, a celebration, acceptance that we all think differently. Um, and then within that, some people think more differently to others, which is the term sort of neurodivergent because they're diverging from the, the majority. Um, and I always compare it to like nature. So in in nature, in, in ecosystems, you've got different plants and different animals, different weather climates, and you've got the bees and you've got the trees and the the bees don't say to the trees, what are you lot doing just standing around all day? You're not doing anything. <laughs> and the trees don't say to the bees, but you're not achieving anything. You just go to each plant for three seconds and move on. They all exist in harmony. And, and I believe the human species is like that, that within our brains, we're all designed to not be thinking the same. And actually, if we all thought in the same way, um, I don't think we'd be here as a species. Mm. And if we eradicated one type of neurotype, like like when I first did my volunteering around the, the idea of curing, the horrible idea, like the world wouldn't be what it was without autistic people. So, um, so neurodiversity to me is the celebration that we all think differently. And then under that umbrella term, I've seen um, workplaces and schools and, and no culture really um, celebrating these different types of minds, um, like autistic minds, ADHD minds, dyslexic minds, um, dyspraxic minds. And there's always an overlap between a lot of those neurotypes. Um, but I've also found throughout my career, like you said, there's a big overlap with mental health um, uh, conditions as well, because a lot of people, especially a lot of autistic people, are perhaps growing up in a world that doesn't understand them. So that's going to lead to high anxiety. My, you know, I, I always say this, I'm not in charge of neurodiversity, but my clear <laughs> dividing line for me is with neurodiversity and the neurodivergent neurotypes, that is the way your brain is wired. And that is, we need to play to those strengths. With the mental health conversation, I, I personally believe they're things that we want to help people alleviate. Like we want to help alleviate your anxiety. Mm -hmm. We don't want to alleviate your autism. So for right. me, the line is around like if yeah if people are depressed or anxious or have low self esteem which you often see correlates quite closely with the neurodivergent profiles they're they're the things that we want to want to help with and and should be should be almost treated we can't really pull people apart but you know some autistic people aren't able to access mental health services because mental health services say you're autistic hmm. and it's very discriminatory so yeah for me the neurotypes are who we are and how our brain works and the mental health conversation is a little bit more about, well, how can we alleviate that? And say for an autistic person, their anxiety is going to be lower, the clearer you communicate with them. Yeah. So it does go hand in hand because the more you understand autism, the more you're going to alleviate anxiety as a knock-on effect. Yeah, and, and you're absolutely right. It's it's one of those things and it feels like, you know, if, if for example, ADHD um, isn't being managed well or you know, from the spectrum, you know, then the mental health symptoms will occur because of it, right? The depression, the anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're absolutely spot on about trying to alleviate those areas rather than alleviate the neurodiversity part of that person, yeah. which I think is key. And like you said, when you started off all those years ago, it was trying trying to fix it, which, yeah. you know, that probably isn't that long ago, to be fair as well, is it? And, you know, thankfully, things are kind of changing as well. Um, in, in terms of like, you know, obviously you do, um, lots of stuff with work, uh, the workplaces. Actually, before I get into that, I want to ask you another question. Because some people can be ADHD with dyslexia, you mm -hmm. know, or they're on the ASC spectrum and they have ADHD. Yeah. Yeah. So that that's that blows my mind because that's even more complex. And that's kind of coming to to kind of it's coming out now that people do have various neurodivergence. Um, yeah. How do people do? I mean, like, what is that coming? Something where people are discovering it's quite new. Um, is that quite difficult to manage, or is it, you know, like, is it something which we're kind of exploring as a society at the moment? I think yeah, there's there's the overlap, and I think I got into neurodiversity because through my work at the National Autistic Society, about fifty percent of people I work with had ADHD, whether diagnosed or not. Um, and I always try to make the the topic as simple as possible. So especially when I train managers and the chapters in my book are on are around this. So I, I acknowledge the um, neurotypes, but then I then I talk about the areas that I see that overlap with all of the neurodivergent profiles. And they can be things around processing or working memory, communication styles, unwritten rules, emotions and um, things around problem solving. So sometimes I talk to managers, especially I'm I'm saying, don't even worry what the label is, because there's such there's such overlap. And you might be working with someone who predominantly thinks they've got ADHD and they would have ADHD, but maybe they're undiagnosed autism. So if you're mm -hmm. just having ADHD training, you're not covering the other stuff. So for me, I always talk about the overlap. 
I say I would love to one day go beyond even the labels um, and just look at those different areas of, of strengths and difficulties. Um, but it, it's certainly a really important point that you raise. Yeah, I think I think it's I think you're absolutely right. And someone said this previously on a podcast about it's recognizing that person's strengths, not their you know uh, limitations maybe mm. as well, and developing their strengths as well. But I think I think also what the you know we know now that lots of people in their adulthood are you know getting diagnosed with uh, all they're going through the process of discovering their own neurodiversity, which they you know probably they had always um, as as children and probably really you know did find things difficult. <clears throat> It's really interesting that what this kind of like this explosion is happening in terms of people being diagnosed. Um, and I think one thing that, you know, people aren't aware of maybe is what they're going through and that self-awareness. And so it might be very difficult to deal with that in, in work situations as well. Um, when you're in the workplace, if you don't know what's going on with yourself. So are there any sort of signs or anything that some people can do to kind of help themselves, do you think, when it comes to feeling that they're not, they're, they're feeling there's something not quite, right or there's something quite they're struggling with some stuff like is there anything they can do for themselves i think at the moment it is like becoming a lot more well known isn't it um perhaps 10 years ago 20 years ago it might have been harder for people and the event i was at the other night there was an autistic person on the panel who said you know she just thought she was broken as a person or there was something wrong with her um so it's great there's so much more information out there now so yeah i advise people to to look into look into it themselves research around it um, the screening tools but one thing you know my philosophy turning it round is I always want workplaces to create that psychological safety where mm-hmm. um, people can can explore it within their workplaces and some workplaces these days not that they have to but some are, are, are providing people with access to diagnosis um, I really passionately believe the more we speak about it the more it's on people's radars so I often find a lot of people come to my training who are sort of um, I'm just going to invent the term neuro curious and they're, they're interested mm-hmm. in it and they come along and then they leave and they're like oh I'm, I'm certainly got ADHD because I talk about it so practically like not mm. from the diagnostic manual so I would love more workplaces to be creating that space that opportunity um, where if people feel like they could be neurodivergent that the workplace can support them with it because I've seen stats which say 20% of the workforce could be neurodivergent doesn't mean diagnosed but up to so that's one in five of your employees so we, we need to be supporting this group and and another group connected to that very closely as parents because um a lot of the people in the workplace that support my work are often parents and neurodivergent children and then sometimes dealing with that in terms of the school system is a whole other job for them so i think this is something workplaces really need to take seriously uh and and create that those resources and that space and um, one of the best things i see is you know like neurodiversity um employee groups and if people feel like they could identify with that group, go along to your groups. You're not going to have to wave a, a diagnostic piece of paperwork. They're very welcoming. Um, and I think just, just research it more and really soak it up. And um, yeah, and I think workplaces have that responsibility to provide that space. They do. I think it's amazing that some workplaces are providing those diagnostic tools because I know there is a wait list and mm. it's quite difficult to kind of get that as well for yourself. I, it, you know, I, I was, I, I'm self-employed and I, I went through the process of trying to uh, create a private health insurance um, scheme for myself as well because, and my partner. Um, but they said that, you know, mental health wasn't included well, or yeah. any anything around that isn't included. And you have to pay a lot more extra for that. And I'm just like, because I know people will use it because it's you know it's yeah. it really does make me feel very upset and very angry about you know things like that because it's just you know it's so key and it should yeah. be you know responsible and be make it accessible for yeah. people to be able to afford to get their diagnoses as well you know yeah, definitely. um okay so in terms of just so you kind of set that up several years ago um um, as you know before like you were your training manager in, in autism beforehand yeah um so tell me what like you know what was the idea for adjust and like what is it what services do you provide to workplaces the idea of adjust was to offer very clear practical uh, and positive training around neurodiversity to employers um especially clear and practical because i'd worked in this sort of sector for, for all my my working life and i would go to conferences around autism neurodiversity and stuff and i wouldn't understand things and I, i've worked in the sector and <laughs> I live and breathe it. So I, I sometimes, you know, one of my popular things that we do is our lunch and learn. 
if I've got 50 minutes to get across these key important points, I want to make it as simple as possible, demystify it, make it very, very relatable. Um, so that was a real key, a key motivator for me because I felt like sometimes in our sector we can overcomplicate it. And, and I could have offline a very complicated conversation with you about this, but I like to make it very clear and, and accessible to everybody, which is really important. So, and I also developed the just to just really focus on three or four main themes, which is the areas that I saw the biggest barriers. So recruiters, so we do training for recruiters. We do things like recruitment clinics where organizations can give me like their interview questions and we can say, this would be hard for a neurodivergent person. We do manager training um, and we do something that's quite popular at the moment called manager coaching. So I'll coach managers that are managing neurodivergent employees. And this goes back to my philosophy where I saw actually it's the workplace that needs the support and the change. Not just the autistic person or neurodivergent person. Managers will come to me and they'll be like, I just don't know what to do. Am I saying the right thing? Um, well, I've tried this, I've tried that. And in a one-to-one -one safe space with me, I think by the time they leave it, I think they feel a lot more confident in the area. Um, and then we do that with HR as well. So we, I think when I set up, one of my friends said that is so niche, but yes, <laughs> it is. Um, and when we set up in 2016, no one really knew what neurodiversity was. But yes. I don't know if you, know, if you saw, but the CIPD did a, a great sort of neurodiversity like campaign about 2018. And, and that was a real watershed moment for, for me. Um, in terms of then after that, a lot more employers are engaging in the topic. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's he got in the space so early because just purely out of your own interest and know that it was really important to help people as well. Like, yeah. you know, there's there's a big focus on mental health. But the thing is as well, like, you know, you have these like mental health awareness weeks or like months, whatever it is. But for me, it feels like it can be quite fleeting and, you know, you can kind of focus in for a week or two or a month, but then it kind of falls off the cliff um, as well. So like what, what are the kind of like, for other employers listening to this podcast, like what are the, you know, top two to three things that people, well, like leaders or companies don't do so well when it comes to supporting neurodivergent employees? Um, no, I think your point's really good around like awareness months or weeks and stuff like that too. Mm. So I suppose where workplaces get the best returns from my work is where they, they really like sort of buy into the whole philosophy. And um, I have a slide where I say like, we need to be looking at recruiters, managers, culture, physical space, employee support. You know, this all fits together. It, it's not a journey. It's a menu. So you pick it and put it together. But where workplace is done best is where they sort of engage with all of that, not just one bit. Because I used to see like workplaces would train managers, but then then the, um, the autistic person's colleagues wouldn't understand autism. So that's not going to work, is it? So I see it best where like everybody's involved. So that holistic approach, basically. Um, and I suppose my top three tips for for managers or workplaces is things around like clear communication. Um, the clearer we are in our communication, the better it is for everybody. But so often, especially in polite British society, um, we are told not to be polite or we're taught not to be polite. And we never say what we mean. We use a lot of phrases which we don't really mean. Um, we have a lot of unwritten rules. There's a chapter in my book on unwritten rules where things we'll judge people on that they do, but we won't tell them we judge them. So clear communication around everything. So if someone's breaking an unwritten rule in a one-to-one -one setting, it's fine to say, you know, you know, I've come across situations where like someone's been shown around the workplace at the start, an autistic person might be shown around and said, you can, yeah, you can use anything in the kitchen. And then the next day they're at the desk eating someone's sandwich and you know, what a, what, <laughs> what drama that causes. And the autistic <laughs> person might say, but I was told I could eat anything in, in, in the, in the fridge or the kitchen. And, and then I often find managers then don't have the confidence to say, really, oh, but that's that. This is that situation. So you don't you don't eat other people's sandwiches. What I mean is, you can use the tea, coffee, and sugar in the kitchen. And the <laughs> managers sometimes say to me, "Well, isn't that patronising?" But I say, "No, I've seen so many autistic people, especially uh, discriminated against because of that kind of stuff. It, it is good in a one-to-one -one setting to address it. So I think clear communication is always my number one and. How does that not benefit all of us? And often when I talk about unwritten rules and British culture, um, anybody that's not been brought up in British culture will always like laugh and, and say, yeah, like you guys are so polite. You never say what you mean. Um, I would love it if you were just a bit more direct and clear. So um, I've always found that really interesting. So clear communication. Um, if someone ever said to me, what's 
the most thing. What's your tip on being inclusive? I would say it's given the same information, but in different ways. So nice. by that, I mean, as a workplace, if you're putting out your comms always on the internet on lengthy, lengthy documents, like I've got ADHD, I'm not reading it. If you put out a 40 second video on your update, I will, I will look at it. So giving the same information, but in different ways, I think is the most inclusive thing you can do. And, and you could even just, it's so easy just to start with doing everything in two ways. It's not that hard. Um, and, and I suppose my third thing is have flexibility and systems. So many mm. workplaces will say, oh yeah, we, we want to be newer inclusive, but, but to get that, you have to fill in this form. It's like, well, that might not work for some people. Like, can I just call you? I will never fill in any forms. I've missed out so much in my life because of <laughs> forms. Yeah. Um, I remember like I didn't sign up to a pension because there was a form I had to fill in. So I just didn't do it. Um, but if I could have rung up someone in HR or gone and sat in a room for half an hour and someone filled in the form with me, I would have got it done. So just some flexibility in your systems. And you can't say you're neuro inclusive as a workplace, but say, oh, but you've got to do it like this. So yeah, clear communication, give the same information, but in different ways and have flexibility in your systems. They're, they're the things that I think will make the world very neuro-inclusive. I love that. I love that. And yeah, people are so, obviously their process is important in, in the workplace, but I think that that's so key that inclusivity is that it needs to be flexible for people mm. as well to engage with and understand. Um, because like, like you said, people designs that if it's designed by a non neurodivergent person then it's just not going to be inclusive and it's getting all the right people you know on the on those on those tasks isn't it as well to make sure that everyone is represented um, and yeah. everyone can understand how that process works i think which i think is like a big job in companies to be fair yeah. but i think it's needed no as well but it's, so key. it's a big I've, investment but yeah yeah i've just done my first neurodiversity champions um sort of package with the workplace and then I'm going to have a call with HR at that workplace in a couple of weeks because they're like, well, we really need to know what's going on in that. And this mm. is exactly what you mean. Like, it's holistic. So if they've got some neurodiversity champions in their workplace, it needs to tie in with HR as well. And that's why I've got those sort of seven different areas that the workplaces need to look at because nothing works in isolation. So absolutely, champions yeah, that's won't be successful true. if HR don't know what's happening and vice versa. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. One thing you mentioned, and it's a topic that I like kind of speaking about when I deliver workshops or coach, is psychological safety as mm. well. Now, actually, this is a learning for me because and I'm probably asking you for advice, to be fair. <laughs> um, because when I talk about psychological safety, I'm probably talking about, you know, uh, including people from different genders and, yeah. and, you know, like ethnic communities and that sort of stuff as well. I don't think I've probably done enough on creating that psychological safety or talking about it for the neurodivergent employees mm. in that company. So tell me more about how, what that means and how people can really establish psychological safety in their companies. You also raised another good point, which is I'd be slightly critical of the neurodiversity world at the moment, which is around intersectionality. Mm. Um, you know, many women go undiagnosed. Um, the, there was a stat recently which showed like 7,000 people were diagnosed in the UK autistic and, um, 5,000 were, were, were men or boys, 2,000 were women or girls, and 97% were white. So, like, that's a whole other conversation, neurodiversity and race. Maybe that's another podcast, but <laughs> it, it, it's something that, if we're talking about psychological safety for everyone, um, is there psychological safety outside of, like, being a white male if you're, if you're neurodivergent as well? But I think one of the things workplaces can do is embrace, of neurodiv embrace neurodiversity very positively. Um, I think senior leaders talking about it, if their own experiences, if they wanted to share it. I've seen senior leaders talk about their own ADHD or their children, or that they just fully support and an advocate of the of the topic. Um, talking about it positively, moving away from talking about it in terms of like, oh, this person with autism suffers, you know, like and talking about and using their language a lot of the autistic community prefer. Um, which would be autistic person or person with autism and, and they certainly don't suffer from it. They, they often say they suffer from other people. But uh, <laughs> uh, so it's talking Thank about you. it positively, having those role models um, that are celebrated. Um, and, and I'm actually going to write about this on LinkedIn soon because I'm, I'm really interested in this. I wonder what you think. But like, you know, when workplaces say bring your authentic self to work, hmm. there's two sides of that. One is, I don't know if I want to. And separately, <laughs> when we say that to autistic people, especially, are we setting them up for failure where we say bring your authentic self and then as workplaces we're not ready for authentic 
autistic people i completely agree i yeah. think it's 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 so it's so nuanced isn't it as well yeah. and and i think you're right see this is why there's so much work to be done this is why we need to replicate you a few times over <laughs> <laughs> to do this because i think that's a great topic because they do say bring your authentic self to work and some people just don't want to you know yeah. they just don't want to do it and what does that mean then in that case you know as well um and it's big, but that's the thing it's like that's why i think the social constructs that we've been in whether it be work or education has just not been advantageous to most people yeah. i think you know i think and then people have suffered so i love that article can't wait to read it yeah yeah <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be interesting because i suppose from the diversity background you and i like we're supposed to really promote that authentic self in the workplace but like what does it really mean underneath the, the heading and and uh, I've often seen a, a lot of autistic people discriminated against once they've been told they can be. So if we're creating psychological safety around it, then we need everyone to have the awareness of what that could look like. Mm. And for me, as um, you know, like a, a white male in Britain, like one of my passions is, is for instance, like football. I would always be allowed to wear that in the workplace. But I was speaking to an autistic person yesterday who said their passion you know, it, it might be like different leaves on trees and no one really wants to talk to them about that. So if they go on about that all day, they've been, they've been told, bring your authentic self to work, but actually no one wants to talk about it. So it's really interesting. Um, it's a really interesting area, I think, which we're just sort of accepting as a, as a, as a term. And then I'd like to explore it. Further. we are complex man we are complex <laughs> it's like every yeah. time we talk about this topic it's like it feels like there's so much to just explore yeah. and discover you know and i think uh, it's almost like you know the dsm like you know they, they kind of mm. like group things together it's almost like they need a separate something separate <laughs> for your diversity yeah. i think as well because it's it's kind of like so many this it, i'm sure over the next several years there's so much more research going to be coming yeah. out you know as well about this and um and what like was at this event the other night, the law event, and there were five neurodivergent people on the panel. And, and I was looking at them thinking like they're such pioneers because even 10 years ago, if you'd have gone to a neurodiversity event in the workplace, it would have been like specialists, external specialists talking about it. It was amazing for me to see that the conversations moved on to these these individuals. And, and um, I don't want to say brave because I don't really like that term, but it, you know, it, it's amazing that they're putting themselves forward. And I'm seeing a sort of the first generation doing that now. And yeah, where are we going to be in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? It's, it's going to be incredible, isn't it? It is. It is. And I, I'm sure Just will be on that journey with you <laughs> as well. So what's your what's your hopes and dreams for, for Just? And where would you like to take it over the um, next sort of five, six years? Good question. I don't know. I need some coaching around that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sometimes it's no busy day to day. You just have yeah. no idea, right? Yeah, you're right. Well, it's interesting because I took six weeks off over the summer um, that coincided with the school holidays as well. But also I just needed that time because it was just so burnt out yeah um, but yeah, really yeah. really really lucky to do what I do but I've always never liked having a manager I think that's sort of around the, the ADHD <laughs> sort of brain but if I'd had a manager they would have probably said you need to take some breaks I didn't really take a break from March to July so you know <laughs> I, I, I've always like oh managers tell me what to do but actually it probably would have helped me to have a manager um I think I'd like adjust to grow as a training company we've got three or four other trainers excuse me that deliver training and and perhaps I, I do a lot more of of my own sort of speaking and, and become sort of more known just for my name instead. But um Very good. I, I I really don't know. <laughs> just... I think it's I think what you're doing is is amazing and uh, much needed as well. And I hope that, you know, like it's it's yeah, I hope that you're able to like help so many more companies as well to yeah. kind of really understand um, how to support their employees who are neurodivergent. How can people get in touch with you? So if they wanted to kind of get you into the company, you know, to their companies and have a chat, lunch and learn, some training, some coaching, how can they get in touch with you? And they can go through the website, adjustservices.co.uk um, or search for me on LinkedIn, Daniel Ahern, A-H-E-R-N-E. -E. There's a few at Daniel Ahern's, but uh, I think I'm the only <laughs> neurodiversity one. So yeah, I'd say LinkedIn or the website really uh, are the best ways. Um, but yeah, I think your question as well is where I, do I want it to go? I just want it to keep going. <laughs> that's the. I think it will. The, I think it yeah. definitely will, and it's so it should. And and um, I, I'm I'm you know I'm so it's so amazing to kind of meet you and, and see all the amazing work you're doing. So thank you so much for spending that time with me today. Uh, for everyone listening, please do get in touch with Daniel um, for your companies and his, his services as well. I think it'd be very beneficial because as we mentioned, you know, it could be that 20% of your neurodiver of your workforce could be neurodiverse. So I think it's super important, but Daniel, thank you very much for joining me on the power with a new podcast. Thank, thank you very you. much. All right. Stop.